told me, hey, I got something fantastic to tell you. He said, I am affiliated with people that speak with the spirits of the dead. How would you like to talk to this, the, the spirit of your dead mother? And I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked. He said, you wouldn't be uh, afraid of talking to, to the spirit of your dead mother, would you? Well, I said, I'll tell you what, I would have to give that some thought, because it's something I never thought about before in my life. What gave you the sense that you now had an opportunity for salvation? What was it that told you you had a chance? Well, um, the Holy Spirit was inspiring me. The Holy Spirit was ministering to me the grace of redemption. And to be able to, to put it into words, uh, I don't have this kind of a vocabulary, because it's, it's, it's a mystery type Thing. The Holy Spirit recreates you as, as, as He ministers to you, you see, and uh, cleans your mind and gives you understanding and, and uh, you see things in different light that you never thought about before. Life becomes a meaningful thing all of a sudden and you'll be waiting to die for it, you see, for, for what you've learned. Because that's what I said to myself. The second night when I went back home, I, I had about an hour in the streetcar to my place. I got home at 12 o'clock. I said, hey, if they do me in tonight, I'm going to have, I have the beautiful experience of having learned these great, wonderful things about God. Beautiful things. So on Wednesday night, there I had the first hope. I can't remember exactly what verse of scripture was, but, uh, but uh, this one uh, here says, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You see, and since you had explained what it meant. And you took that right into your heart. Yeah. Roger, mm -hmm. during these three days, from Monday night, Tuesday night, to Wednesday night, what went through your mind regarding the spirits? I knew that I was going to uh, be worked over by the spirits, either through one of their boys or some accident or something, see. This is the way I felt, I mean. And um, I said, this is very unusual, that nothing has happened yet. And I'm going home on Wednesday night again with, with another appointment for Thursday Bible study at 7 o'clock. Now, let me make sure I understand. You had missed Wednesday night's spirit praise yeah, oh, service, yes. uh, yeah. at which time you were supposed to have so made your yeah. full commitment. Yeah, I would have and you had been at an a Bible answer. study instead. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what happened next? So I said, um, this will be the end of it. Wednesday night I said, they, they'll have a praise section to the gods, and that'll be it. Uh, but nothing happens Wednesday night. Thursday morning I was alive, and I went back for another Bible study, and, and that is four more. And uh, by then I realized that the Creator was taking care of things. Because these people never give God the glory, but they always refer to higher powers. They respect, they, re, they, they pride themselves on the fact that they respect authority, you see. So therefore, they, they recognize the Creator for, for who He is. And, uh, but of course, the, the Master, fallen Lucifer, is just as smart as God is. And He's got, he's got it worked out, so He's going to have a kingdom to him, Himself for eternity, and you know, you don't have to worry about things. So I realized that, that the power of God was intervening. Now I became a, a brave, see? And the Spirit of God gave me the strength to do that. Because I, I said that God gave me the strength to be able to die for, for these things that I just learned, see? And that's what happened. I got those uh, Bible studies. So you went ahead and went to a Bible studies on Friday night? Yeah. And then you kept your first Sabbath. Oh, yeah. you? Tell, tell us about your experience on Sabbath. <clears throat> First, that evening, um, before I left, 11 o'clock, Cyril says, uh, you enjoy the Bible studies? Oh, yeah, very, very much so. I said, tomorrow you people are going to church. He says, yeah. I said, uh, interesting. He said, would you like to come with us? I said, yeah. Because I had the, I had the Bible study on the Sabbath already. I said, sure. I'm still alive. And he said, what do you mean by you're still alive? Well, I said, I said, you know, I'll see if I'm still alive. Uh, 
I'll be, I'll be here, I'll do this, I'll do that. But I knew what I was, what I'd said. I'm still alive. And uh, he said, "Would you join us here, uh, and we'll walk to church? It's not that that far. We'll uh, walk a few blocks, and uh, nice, uh, be a nice day tomorrow." I said, "Yeah, sure, meet you here." And uh, we walked to church, and we were welcome at the door, and there was a rack of, of uh, uh, brochures on the walls. I walked over and looked at some of them, picked up a couple, put it in my pocket, and uh, we were from Sabbath school, and I thought it was great. Roger, the Lord helped you get through the Sabbath day without smoking. How did you eventually deal with your smoking habit? Well, I tell you, Pastor Taylor uh, talked, uh, you know, for quite a while. When it gets to be about quarter seven in the evening, I was getting uh, very distressed because I, I got a tremendous urge of smoking about an hour before. And I said, oh, I've got to have a cigarette. I just can't stand it anymore. And uh, as the pastor continued explaining what I had to ask him to explain, uh, it was difficult for me. And <clears throat> as he left, I told Cyril uh, and said, yes, I'm sorry, but I, I got to smoke. And um, on the way home in the streetcar, I said to myself, this is going to be, he used expression, but a hell on earth to give up smoking. Then I said, no. It's not going to be, because I'm going to have help. I got to my apartment, and uh, I opened a closed closet, and I had two cartons of cigarettes on the shelf. And I opened them up, and threw all the cigarettes, you know, all the packs were opened up, threw in, in, into the toilet, and, and flushed it down the drain. And uh, then I knelt by the little table that I had there with, with my Bible on it, and... Uh, I had that already had started to read that crucifixion of Christ, which I have read for 45 years now, every morning. Matthew, the 27th chapter, verses 24 through 54. Every day, God willing, I, I always read it. Well, now I can I have my devotions at night, and I don't have to put the light on because I know it by heart, see? Mm -hmm. But uh, there I place my trust and in, in my life in the, in the care of the Lord of glory, who had shed his precious blood on Calvary, to acquire the legal right to be able to redeem me from where I was and from where I was going. So that was the end of smoking. Never, never had a desire to smoke again. Mm -hmm. I told him to take desire away to recreate me. I realized that he was a creator he can recreate. Yeah. Rogers, you came closer to making a full commitment to God. Did the demons try to prevent you from making that commitment in any way? Well, I didn't have to wait too long. <laughs> uh, during the week, the Spirit of God held back the, the demon spirit so that he could not have access to me. I realized that from Wednesday night on. Then, as I came uh, home at midnight of that uh, Saturday night, there was a note on my door from my buddy. And he said, it is urgent that I talk to you tonight. I don't care if you call me in the middle of the night. But he says, i got to talk to you. We're having a terrible disaster. To, uh, you know, facing a terrible disaster. So uh, I said, well, Roland, one well, must, must have gotten some, some real static, you know. Sure enough, first of all, I wanted to, to review something that we'd studied at night. So. I had a book. He had they lent me a book, uh, uh, St. Cyril, and I opened the book up and I started to, to read. And uh, there was a marker, a sheet of paper actually, that had been cut in half in there. And uh, I had put it on the table. And uh, the piece of paper started to levitate and move around the room. See? So it didn't bother me. I knew, I knew what was was doing it. And then the, the sheet of paper came and, st and stood about a foot above my book. Then it was slapped down on the book, and the book fell on my lap, and almost into the floor I picked it up. See? And I felt like saying, uh, telling the spirits, you know, buzz off. But uh, I had understood that it's, it's, it, I would not, again, talk with spirits. I had made up my mind on that. 
So I pick up the book again, started to write, and then the spirit picked up the book and threw it across the room against the wall with tremendous force. So I decided, well, I'm going to go and phone my buddy, see what he's going to do. Then I was at a phone, a public phone in the hallway. I didn't want to use it. I went down to a, a diner or restaurant or just uh, down the block, and I called him up. How's things rolling? He says, man, he says, oh, he says, don't you care f for my life, Morno? What kind of a friend are you? I've been suffering, he says, for, since Wednesday. He says, trying to get a hold of you. And he says, I've been waiting at your door. What time did you come home? I said, come home at midnight. He said, you're in real trouble. Because this, the high priest, as a spirit appeared to him on Wednesday evening and told him that you, had, you were studying the Bible with some Christians. But you were not just studying the, studying the Bible with Christians. You were studying the Bible with Seventh-day Adventists. The people that the Master hates most on the face of the planet. How in the world did you get yourself involved in something like that? Don't you care for your life? I said, sure. Beside that, he says, and he told me in, uh, other things that the Spirit had told, uh, you know, uh, the uh, high priest. So it went, the conversation went on the phone for a while, and I said, now listen. It's not possible for me to explain to you over the phone what has taken place in my study in the Bible four hours per evening, you know, through the week. Why don't you come to see me tomorrow sometime and I'll give you the reasons, the real reasons why I did what I did. He said, okay. So we made an appointment for uh, sometime Monday, uh, Sunday morning. And... Uh, I went back after my phone call, I went back to my apartment. And then uh, I decided I might as well get to bed slight. I get to bed. I was not sooner in bed that the lights went on. I got up, went to the lights off. Get back to bed, the light goes on again. I said to myself, there's no use getting up, turning the lights off. They're going to put them back on again. So I'm going to decide to go to sleep with, with the lights on. So after a while, things start moving around the place. A picture on that wall <laughs> goes and sticks itself on the wall. There's no, uh, nothing to hold it up. And the light that was on the table moved and stands in midair. It stays there. Were you feeling afraid at this time? Oh, no, not at all. No. No, no because of the fact that, uh, you see, you get, human beings get accustomed to a lot of things. And you get supernatural strength, either from good or evil. Mm -hmm. And the Lord was, was uh, singing me through this thing. And I knew that I was going to have a terrible struggle somewhere along the way, some, somehow. And you were going to try to destroy me, no question about it. So... After this nonsense had gone uh, quite a while, I, I went on to sleep. Hey, I'm going to get my rest. I'm tired. I said, Lord, you know, bless the old guy. I was not old in those days. No. I said, bless the fellows. I can get some rest from these spirits. And I went to sleep. And they, it woke me up about 2 o'clock in the morning again. And at 4 o'clock, now 4, 4 o'clock in the morning there, I, I sat up in bed, pushed my pillow in the back, and I said to myself, what in the world? am I going to do? Because the Lord doesn't clear them out of, uh, for me. Then I, I got a thought that maybe the Lord just wants me to know from the spirits exactly how things are, uh, how I'm standing with them. And I said to the spirit, you want to talk to me? The spirit said, yes, finally, and we will talk to you. What in the world do you think you're doing? You see, the Lord had held back even on the spirits that the spirits could not talk to me. I realized that they were under a, a very special control. So I got to talk with the spirit. And I realized that he was a spirit counselor. Because he said, the master has tremendous plans for your life. Fame, honor, respect, wealth. 
don't you value any of these things? I said, I said, I want you to know, Spirit, that uh, 10 days ago, I would have grabbed your offer. But now you're talking to a former spirit worshiper, and I'm educated to the reality of life, especially of the reality of eternal life. And I said, I'm not interested. For about maybe two or three minutes, maybe four minutes, and it's a long time, in a conversation, there was n no response to what I had said. It was like he was totally amazed by your yeah. courage. Yeah. Then when the spirit spoke again, he had a, 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 a tremor in his voice. In other words, you know when a person gets really desperate in a crisis situation, your voice is, 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 changes. And uh, it gave me the impression that he had a hard time expressing himself. And that was a very clever uh, individual. Well, he said, we've worked for so long, over the years, to prepare you for the Master's work. And what are you doing? You know? And things like that. And uh, he told me, okay, you're, you're, you're turning down the offer of the Master. I said, definitely. He said, from now on, he says, you will, poverty will be a lot of your life. That is, he says, if you can manage to stay alive. And he says, that I doubt that, that you won't want to have much of. He says, your days are numbered. I said, you know, Spirit, the high priest has mentioned about higher powers. I'm uh, affiliated now with higher powers. And I said, I don't have to concern myself with you or your master or any of the other spirits because you're all losers. I am the winner. A hundred million years of perfect life recreated, translated, or resurrected body that I'll have. Uh, my years will be in, in, counted into the millions of years. If I take the offer of the Master, what do I have? I'm 20 years of age. Add, even if I live to be 100, how can you compare that to 100 million years? And I'll have a, all the gold that I want and the silver that you're offering me, and more. So, I'm not a loser no more. I'm a winner. And the spirit, the spirit says, will destroy you. And he laughed. He had this, this, this was frightening. For, for, for one time, he had this laugh that, uh, that caused me to think immediately of the laugh that Nero, instantly, Nero must have had on his face when the lions were tearing the Christians apart. That's the thing I said, this is the way that Nero must, must have laughed. When the, the lions were tearing Christians apart, you know, in the arena of the Colosseum in Rome. Yeah. So how did the spirit finally leave, Roger? They finally leave, almost took the door away with him. <laughs> he left through the balcony door, and the door um, was slammed open, yeah, open. And the, the doorknob almost went through the plaster in the wall. Did he leave on his own accord? I commanded him to. I commanded him in the name of the Lord Jesus to leave my place to come no more. And he left? And he left. And instead of slamming the door shut behind him, like a person would, he slammed the door open as he went out, and he slammed in, in, into the wall. Of, of, and, and the doorknob, Cyril may still remember, you could see the imprint of the uh, doorknob in, in the plaster of an, the house was maybe... Uh, 50 years old, so the plaster had been settled a long time. You commanded the demon to leave by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yep. He, he left, Jesus. slammed the door. Did you go back to sleep? Yeah. And then the next morning, your friend Roland came over. Well, it, it, between that, uh, I'd like to tell you a little okay. bit more. I woke up in the morning, of course, and I said, my, time to get up. And uh, my Bible, my night table was to my left. As I was laying in bed, I, I put my hand on the Bible, and then I started to shuffle, you know, the pages, like this. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about many things, and I was doing this. And all of a sudden, I opened the Bible, wide open. And then I got thinking about it again. Never realizing what I had done. I got up, and after... Uh, 
I straighten myself out a little bit. I, I, I look at the, at the Bible. And my eyes fell on this uh, Isaiah chapter of uh, Isaiah uh, uh, the prophet. And I got to read it. And it was the experience of Ezekiel when uh, Sennacherib, the great general of the armies of the Assyrians, had uh, compassed about the city of Jerusalem. And he was telling uh, Ezekiel that he might as well give up open the gates, you know, you're not going to survive this because we've destroyed all the nations uh, that we've gone through before getting here. And uh, I was very impressed. The fact that Zechariah took the letter that the general had sent him, and he went in the temple of the Lord and placed it before the Lord, and he talked to the Lord about the, the letter. You see? And as for his predicting care and, and guidance, and when he had not yet returned to his, to his castle, when as Isaiah came, the prophet, and he told, uh, he says, uh, the Lord has got a message for you. The way that Sennacherib has come, that's the way that he's going to return. And uh, I love that prayer, that is a kind of prayer. I memorized that. It was a beautiful prayer. Because I got, it, from that moment on, I got an inner desire to fortify myself with the Word of God. Because every time that I, that I read the verse in the Bible that applied to my condition, I received encouragement and strength. And I said, this is what I need to do. I'm going to fortify myself with, with the Word of God. I'm, I'm going to memorize the Word of God. I, I, I write there and then I took a piece of paper. I underlined those verses of the prayer of Ezekiel in red in the Bible. I wrote down on a piece of paper, put it in my pocket, my coat pocket. So when I traveled on the tramway, you see, I could memorize uh, that. And I've done that now for uh, <laughs> 45 years and I'm still memorizing things, you know. Because Elda says to me, once she said, are you still memorizing? I says, yeah. Why are you memorizing? You know so much of the Bible and everything. I said, well, I need some more. You got to yeah, you gotta have, uh, keep feeding yourself spiritually. Mm. And that was the blessing that it, that it was. I saw there a beautiful deliverance. And then I read the rest of the chapter and it shows that during the night, the angel of the Lord went out. So when the general and his uh, officers uh, woke up in the morning, they look over the camp and all their soldiers were dead. And they took off for Nineveh before they were done in. And he went uh, to the temple of Nishrab, his god, and uh, son of Carib. And while he was worshipping there, uh, his sons came in and put a dagger in his back. And he fled to, to the land of the Arameans. I was very impressed with that. And I, had, I left it, the, the Bible open there. I had my worship. When my friend came over, uh, the Bible was still there. So, Whenever your friend Roland came over, you had just finished your worship time and you had read the story about yeah. Sennacherib. Mm -hmm. What did he say? Was, did he feel agitated? Was he upset? Oh, yeah. He came in and sat himself down and he said, I can't believe it. Not of all people, he says, not Mono would do a stupid thing like daring the spirits. You know? He said, you're, you're, in, you're an intelligent man, aren't you? You know, you, you got a choice. The high priest tells me that if you come to see him with me now, no problem. Everything's going to be straightened out of the spirits. He promised him that already. He got that assurance. And he said, uh, let's do the right thing. Why gamble with your life? I said, well, I'll tell you what. I don't feel like going to sit high priest. Now or ever. And we conversed about, uh, about a number of things. And uh, he said, well, I hate to have to tell you this. But seeing that you don't, you decided that you're not going to have anything to do anymore with, with the master and his people. I hate to tell you this, that the priest, the high priest told me that a price has been put on your life. A medical doctor, remember, give me a name, has pledged $10,000 to have you done in. How did you feel whenever you found out that you had a contract out on your life? Well, uh, it surprised me a little, but I had, I had prepared myself for something worse. So that I didn't, uh, it didn't bother me too much. 
Because see, the strength of the Lord, the word of the Lord, was, the Spirit of God was giving me strength. Okay, was the yeah. presence of the Spirit of God evident to Roland there that Sunday yeah. morning? As we talked, and now he decided that, that he was losing, he was losing the battle. He became very nervous. And he got up and went to the door, put his head on the door, and we talked there. He says, Mono, please. If it's not for you, say, do it for me. Do you realize what's going to happen to me if something happens to you? I don't know how to go to treat me. I said, hey, man, let me tell you something. I got a, night, I got a suggestion for you. You, join, you. you come with me. I'll guarantee you all the protection that you need. You live the right, ripe old age. And beside that, I'll tell you what. Uh, you should go back and tell the high priest and all his boys to come to our church. I'll arrange with my minister to have a uh, hundred spaces there, right off the center aisle. I felt like I'm making them an invitation. Well, he says, well, I would never say a stupid thing like that. He says, well, that's, that's your responsibility. I said, uh, no, you, uh, things are settled. He lit a cigarette. And as he read the cigarette, I, I, I saw his hand shake like this. And uh, I said, you're quite nervous. Well, let me tell you, he says, there's a power here, a presence that I'm not accustomed to. I'm very uncomfortable because there's a, there's a power here that, says, that, that, that makes me terribly uh, uncomfortable. Well, I said, you know what it is? the presence of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Creator, the Life Giver. And I said, every other power is subject unto that higher power. You're aware of that. Oh, yeah. So that's the way that um, it ended. He now, decided to go. He told you that you had a contract put out in your life. Yeah. How did you respond to him? He was nervous, but he said oh, yes. to you... You're, you're walking under the shadow of death, mm -hmm. Morneau. How did you respond? I said, my friend, I got some news for you. Not so much for you as, as it is for the high priest. And now the Spirit of God gave me very special righteous indignation. Have you ever heard of that terminology? Mm -hmm. That when I heard that they were going to do me in, with, uh, you know, have me shot, I said, look, I got some news for the high priest and his boys. The day that they wipe me out and you know, they uh, do me in will be the day that the life giver is going to pull the bread of life on all of them except the high priest. And they'll be dead cadavers there in the, in, in, in the temple. And tell the high priest this, don't call funeral directors because they don't, they don't have enough, uh, you know, um, no, I'm just, but the, what he coffins? No, the the the, the wagon. Oh, hearses. Hearses. <laughs> hearses. I said you better call the the fire department, of Montreal. Then you pile them all up there, the whole hundred of them. I said this is what's going to take place. He said he said you're a fool. I said you think so? Let me show you something. Picked up the Bible, and I said I'm going to tell you a little story. Make it short. He said short because he says I'm I'm going. I said, listen to this. I just read this this morning. There's a man by the name of Ezekiah that believed in the Creator a few hundred years back. And let me tell you, tell you what happened to him. Sennacherib came with his armies, told me the, the story. He went before the Lord and, and, and prayed about it. And the Lord says, the wind that Sennacherib came, he's, that's the way he's going to go home. And during the night, 185,000 men were, were destroyed by the angel of the Lord. So I said, don't tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about. I said, I can assure you that if they put a bullet in me, they're all going to lose out because the, the Creator will remove your breath of life. And I felt as sure of that as if uh, I have, this was a prediction that I think the Lord would have backed up my word. So how did he respond after you told him that story? Well, he said, uh, I guess he says that I've lost my, my time. Before we part, he says, I don't want to even shake your hand because you're not a friend of mine no more. 
I said, you have it your way. If ever we meet one another anywhere in the city of Montreal, don't you ever look at me like you know me, because I'll ignore you and embarrass you, he says, wherever we are. He says, fine. No problem with that at all. <laughs>